there. Woohoo! Yeah, there are a few more seats at the front. Three. Come on in. in. Fact, come on in. Okay. Oh, yeah. <laughs> nice to see so many people. Well, that's cool. I can see a thing. No, I don't see any people, <laughs> but uh, I see some heads. Yeah, we know you're here. So, mm. welcome everybody. Welcome. <sighs> Shall we Shall begin? We yeah, let's begin. Right. Okay, let me try this. <coughs> Death by Dandine. <laughs> <laughs> Did that work? <laughs> yeah, it's a good start. Uh, welcome. Um, before we start uh, with the presentation itself, I'm going to tell you some disclaimers. Uh, this presentation, uh, most of the graphics in the presentation has been created with uh, one of the hipster AI text-to-image uh, solutions out mm -hmm. there right now, mid-journey to be in fact uh, concrete. So uh, we would like some uh, feedback on that afterwards. Also, this is the first time we are doing this presentation, so we are a bit unsure about the timing. So uh, questions after the presentation, so I just oh. sure make sure to have time. Yeah. We, we expect to have uh, enough time for questions, uh, and you're very welcome to ask them. So um, before we start, uh, just a, a little bit about the people standing on the scene. Mm. Uh, me and Rune, we are from a small company called uh, Udex. We are four people, four security nerds, uh, doing the identity, digital identity, doing uh, API security, uh, trust services nowadays. Uh, we are really good at OAuth and OpenID mm -hmm. Connect, those protocols. We have been working with those for a few years now. Quite a few, actually. Quite a few. Yeah. Uh, the company is turning 10 years next year, so then we will have, have a party here at NDC. Mm. So uh, everybody's <laughs> invited already. <laughs> Please attend. Reserve the date <laughs> next year. Yeah. So my name is uh, Rune. Uh, what to say? We have to introduce ourselves, you know. Uh, I've been programming since uh, childhood. That's been a while now. And, and I'm one of those people who still love doing that. Enjoy, well, I do too much talking, too little programming nowadays, but it's still fun, and I plan to do it as long as I can. At the, the last years, I've been focusing very much on identity and the protocols, OAuth, OpenID Connect, and <laughs> I recommend uh, the rest of you do that as well, because it's, it's a really interesting topic. Doug? It is. Uh, my name is Dag, Dag Esterhagen. Uh, as the keynote speaker today, I also started uh, doing this for money in 1997. So I've been doing it for quite a few years, also a developer, uh, but coding less nowadays. So we'll get back to that. <laughs> um, science fiction and fancy nerd. Uh, read books all the time, games, do all the classic stuff, just go do some yoga. That's uh, also recommended for everybody mm -hmm. who are developers. Uh, the Twitter nick uh, is, <laughs> is not really in use. I haven't used Twitter for five years, so please don't go there. <laughs> 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 All right. Um, we are working for a company called Norsk Helsenet. Um They are a big uh, customer. They are a big customer. Yeah. They own the solution we are going to talk about and um, do the operations on it and develop it. About 700 employees in Norway, based in Oslo, uh, Tromsø, Trondheim, uh, do infrastructure, do development, uh, do operations. Uh, in Norway, we have a separate network, uh, separate from the internet, called the Health Network which all uh, health organizations in Norway uh, have used. It's a really interesting company in strong grow growth. Um, they do have a booth uh, in the common area. Visit them. And uh, uh, Simon and Fredrik, are you here? 
No, yeah. they are going to have a talk uh, about uh, Norsk Helsenet later today, three o'clock after this. So uh, visit them. Yeah, the room number three. Room but number three. Just out of curi curiosity, how many of you uh, know of Norsk Helsenet and uh, the Norwegian health, health sector? Yeah, more, more, more than half of you. Uh, the so health sector so is probably well <laughs> known. <laughs> 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 yeah, hopefully. It's something that <laughs> matters for all of us. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Uh, just a short, short intro on uh, the Norwegian health sector, how it's organized uh, in Norway. We have uh, four health regions. Uh, the regions are the ones operating the hospitals, the public hospitals in Norway. Each region has its, its own infrastructure, uh, its own uh, solutions, and uh, basically operates in independent of the other regions. I'm quite proud of this, <laughs> as uh, everybody <laughs> sees the municipalities in Norway. <laughs> Ish. It will be worse, I promise. 350 of them. Uh, they also have their own health services, their own IT infrastructure, their own user directories, etc. Uh, also, the municipalities do other stuff than health, so it's all mixed together for those. Uh, of course, we do have the private sector, both vendors making solutions, IT solutions. We have uh, uh, private actors selling health services to people, etc., etc., and selling services to the public sector. And then we have the national services. Norsk Helsenet is a provider of some of them. You have uh, Helsedirektoratet, Folkehelseinstituttet, and a lot of other actors in that area. And in addition to this, of course, we have a buttload of uh, laws and regulations making this work. Really complex, um, it, it, it kind of regulates everything uh, related to health. IT is one of the parts of it, but there's a lot of other stuff. We have GDPR, of course. Uh, we have laws for uh, what rights you as uh, for people living in Norway have when it comes to health services. We have laws regulating how uh, organizations providing health services should treat their uh, data and how they should build their systems, and etc. A lot of them. So uh, these laws ah, equals the complicatedness. Uh, these laws basically say that uh, Norwegian people are entitled to as a good health service as you, as you can get. Uh, this kind of regulates how uh, health personnel should uh, um, what kind of information they should be provided with when they are treating a patient. Uh, when they sit down with you as a patient, they should have all the correct information, all the necessary information about you for the kind of treatment you are getting, only that, of course, nothing more, at the right time, right now, when you need it. That's okay when uh, you are just working some of this information is residing in the organization the health personnel is working. In the system they are using, in the journal, a lot of information will be there. But as we saw in the previous uh, slide, a lot of information will be somewhere else in Norway. Maybe in the same municipality, maybe in another region, maybe some completely different place. So how do you then, how do you solve that? Of course, it's uh, all about APIs. It's about uh, providing health information using APIs. Uh, sounds easy, right? Uh, the problem is that uh, the laws we talked about a while ago uh, really strictly regulate how these APIs should work. 
when you as an organization are sharing sensitive health information about a person with someone, you do have to know some things. You do have to know who you are sharing the person, the health personnel you are sharing the information with. That's mandatory. You also have to know which organization is that uh, health personnel working in right now, for right now. So HealthSida, which we are going to talk about today, is the lube that makes this happen, which makes it possible. Um, we do provide a uh, national service for authenticating users independent of where they work. We have identity providers, which basically, like Monkey the Confidence Bypass, which uniquely identifies a person in Norway. We uh, have built uh, solutions for identifying organizations. Where do this person work right now? A person might work several places. It's not an easy fix for this, but we have gotten quite far along. And these capabilities we have, we provide them to APIs to use in a standard, uh, standardized way using some standard protocols. Yeah. Yeah. I think you can <coughs> bring it on. So, Halsey uh, has been a, a project going on for, for a very long time. It's been a political goal for at least 10 years that we sh should build this common uh, functionality. So, I just wanted to say a few things about the timeline of Halsey. Um, we, the, the service was established in 2018, in November. We started very small, with the limited capabilities, mainly user logon, those kind of things. And uh, we started with a few systems that used Telsida for logon, and a few APIs, very small. Then we've had, uh, like in, you see in the cartoon here, at the the first uh, uh, figure, where we have uh, a slow linear growth. Slowly, new systems were added, new APIs were added, and things are <laughs> quite quiet. Then, uh, a couple of years ago, we had a pandemic, the corona pandemic, and it was decided that everything uh, related to uh, handling the pandemic in Norway. We're talking about uh, vaccination, we're talking about uh, following up who, uh, who are sick, who aren't sick. Everything, all the ga data gathering and reporting and everything had, was going to be secured by Halsire. So we took off. And uh, so we'll be going on a much uh, steeper uh, <laughs> course from then. <laughs> And uh, from uh, um, probably maybe already th this year, next year, we fear that we will start having more of an exponential growth, as in the second uh, box in a cartoon here. We see we are uh, at that moment we are going to secure more or less all electronic uh, prescriptions in Norway, and everybody wants prescriptions, so we're gonna. We expect to take off, and uh, <laughs> we are kind of afraid of ending up in one of the two, or the bottom left <laughs> uh, graph where we take off and un uncontrolled. We try to avoid that. We're not going into, into box number four. <laughs> uh, <coughs> the, the capabilities of Halsida started easy, uh, quite simple. We identified uh, or authenticated people. Uh, but we have been adding features uh, uh, lately, and so now we can uh, identify organizations, and there's more coming. Uh, at the moment, I want to say that uh, we are running in the operation center offered by Norskansnet. So we have an availability, an SLA, as they call it, at 99.7%. That's the guarantee. We are going to secure some of the most critical s systems in Norway, the emergency services. 
and they require a quite much higher degree of availability. We'll come back to that. So we are aiming for at least 99.9%. That equals about an hour of downtown time in a month. And, we, and that is uh, the worst case scenario that we are going for. And uh, as we also come back to, we are becoming a single point of failure for everything uh, regarding health in Norway. And uh, that's basically what we're going to focus on from now, now that you know our service. Doug. But we have to explain a bit more about how things work. Yeah. yeah. Uh, this is not an... Uh, presentation about identity or the protocols or anything, mm -hmm. but uh, it's, it's nice to have some background. Mm -hmm. uh, how many people ha here don't know OpenID Connect or what? Like, nothing? Yeah, a couple, yeah. So you probably have uh, insight in how this works. Mm -hmm. um, it is, we are, a classic standard OpenID Connect and OAuth 2 uh, solution, the uh, OpenID Connect for authenticating users, OAuth for securing APIs. Uh, nothing special about that. Uh, I won't go into detail about the flow. The, the, the main part about this figure is that uh, we are in the middle. You have an application which needs to call an API and to make that possible, Helsede has to be there. That's the important part. So both uh, worth mentioning that both the client application where the user logs on has the requirement that, that Helsede is available, but also the API. So we have dependency on both, both sides there. Mm. Yeah. So we do uh, basically what everybody else on the internet do nowadays, using those protocols. Mm -hmm. That is, we do have we do use the, the, the specifications in themselves are very bro uh, broad and fuzzy. You can choose how to do it. So we have chosen a very strict way of using these protocols. We look very closely to the finance sector, what they are doing in open banking, <coughs> financial, uh, financial grade uh, APIs, etc. Uh, very uh, inspired by that. But we do have our own, own profile, which is very strict. Uh, we basically uh, require uh, what 2.1 nowadays. So we are in the middle. Uh, so if we disappear, something will happen. Uh, basically, basically, what will happen is that an API needing to either just authenticate the user or use an API will fail mm. when invoking Helsida. Uh, that can be really bad today. Uh, effects today of that happening is that uh, you maybe won't be able to get your uh, electronic prescription a recept, so you have to get it on pen and paper instead. Uh, we provide uh, information about um, uh, uh, critical info, allergies, etc., about some patients. So when you're ends up at their hospital and are going to be operated. You really, the doctor really wants to know your allergies, so mm -hmm. you don't get, the, the, um, get something you shouldn't get. That information won't be available, so it's bad. But it can get worse, and will get worse in the future. Nope. Uh, like uh, Rune said, uh, uh, next year we will be protecting the emergency services. That's 113. Norwegian version of uh, 911 in Norway. So if Helse Ida is unavailable, the people uh, working, receiving the calls, won't be able to use their systems. And that's, uh, that can't happen in Norway. We it can't, can't happen. That. It can't happen. So, uh, so we use uh, a bit of energy on being available. Uh, the point is, uh, we are a single point of failure, so we do have a policy that all systems providing critical health services which use health there 
do need a plan B. What should you do to provide the necessary health care if health data is unavailable? You do have to have a plan B. Uh, even though we have 99.99999% SLA, you do have to have an alternative. Uh, of course, uh, the health care the patient gets won't be probably be lacking. The quality won't be the same, but you do still have to be able to do the work and use your system as a health personnel. They can't fail. Right. Yeah. Let's mention that there are some alternatives. For instance, you can have alternative logon methods. You can have emergency access to a system. You say, no, I have to access to this data even though the system doesn't really know for sure who I am. I need this to treat a person. Treating someone is more important than, the, than information security, actually. And then you have the good old pen and paper. <laughs> <laughs> but you, you understand that neither of these are scalable. Mm. And in the, even in the best case, they offer uh, a dras drastically reduced quality of the service. Mm. So how do we approach <laughs> risk? How do we approach uh, uh, making sure that we are available? Uh, we have a couple of things that we are worried about. And don't worry too much about the size of uh, the slices here. The, the topics are more important. So, uh, the first thing that we're worried about is uh, quality or the complexity of our own code. We are developers, we write code, we have fun doing that, you know, lots of good ideas. Uh, yeah, you know, things uh, <laughs> can go bad sometimes. But we are really worried about that. Complexity is maybe the, the biggest danger for us because we need to have control of everything. So we worry a lot about uh, the complexity and the quality of our code. Related to that is uh, complexity, quality, and bugs in external code, external libraries. We, like everybody else, we, we have external dependencies. We, we are built on the Microsoft uh, .NET uh, uh, stack, and our service is built on Duende Identity Server. We'll come back to that as well. And uh, apart from a couple of selected uh, Microsoft libraries, we try to avoid any dependency at all. Of course, that can be a risk uh, in itself, having to uh, <laughs> implement stuff on our side. So it's a balance there. But we try to have as much control of everything, all the code that's running in our service. That means re we read the code, for instance, like, with identity server, we know more or less everything that's going on there. We have read everything. Also in the relevant yeah. parts of the code from Microsoft. Yeah. And that's really important for us. Further on, we are worried about, uh, I call it infrastructure in this figure. That is, uh, we're worried about uh, uh, the infrastructure where we are running, errors and problems there. And also, we are worried about uh, external dependencies to external services. For instance, for a service like ours, we need to know who a person is. We need to know your name, for instance. And we need to know if a person is a health personnel. Those are national registries that we can look up. But uh, in a naive implementation, we, we would have a dependency on those services to be available. We can't have that. Further on, we have uh, other external dependencies. For, in for instance, <laughs> we consider we have a database, but that is an external dependency for us. We don't trust it. Even though it, if it goes down, we need to be available. And also, the, the runtime environment at, at Senos Kelsnet, we really don't trust that as well. Even if they go down, we need to be available. And how do we handle that? Uh, another thing we are worried about is incorrect use of our service. We are, seen from our point of view, we are a very simple service. We offer uh, uh, 
basically to APIs. But uh, there are many ways of using them, and uh, um, not, not necessarily a malicious user, but uh, someone using the service wrong could potentially affect uh, the quality of our service and our availability. So we spend a lot of time on training. Everybody who, before they are allowed to use uh, Health City, we do a quality assurance of mm, the product. And uh, we s spend a lot of time teaching people how to use the service. What, what you will see here is that external attackers, that's uh, the smallest slice. We are, of course, worried about uh, hackers, DDoS, and all that stuff, but running inside mm, the health network in Norway, we, we get a lot of uh, security for free. Norwegian uh, North Net, they are very good at monitoring and operations and all that, and they handle it for us. So you see that we are kind of a specialist service. We do one thing and only one thing, and so we can uh, <laughs> focus on doing that very good. So uh, this model, by the way, it has uh, some serious consequences for how we work and how we prioritize. So you will see it later, later on when we go into the details. Uh, let's talk about the technical view. How is uh, Health City built? And as you see, it's simple. We really <laughs> just have, <laughs> yeah, but it's that simple. We have a .NET 6 uh, host. It's a web service. And uh, it's really a, a couple of APIs, mainly two, and that's it. We have some dependencies to other stuff. That's all the external registries and other things that uh, carry data that we want to have. And then we have our database. The, and this is, this is where you see that we, we are kind of, we're not quite the regular web app. The, for instance, nobody wants to use our service. There are nobody who wants, hey, we want to use Helsida. No, they want to use Helsida to gain access to the National Core Journal, to do electronic pres prescriptions. They want to have log on to their own service and so on. Nobody wants our service on its own. So we are, we can, more be considered an infrastructure component more than a service uh, in itself. Um, as I said, we are built on the identity server, and uh, we are really happy about that. We are so we are building a service on the competence of some really really good people, Dominic and Brock. Thank you. And. Uh, one thing that is uh, special about uh, Health ID, I want to tell, is we call it Health ID as a health ID for the uh, English speaking audience. But we don't offer <laughs> an ID. You cannot, cannot, you cannot log on to our service. We al always uh, uh, use external logon. So all this other stuff in the figure. Uh, that is uh, the, the bank ID, it's the bypass, uh, smart card logon, it's uh, other regional services for logon. So we, d we don't even do that, but we have dependencies. Uh, our database, is it, we have uh, two types of data. We have uh, the static data, that is configurations of systems and APIs that are secured by HealthSeeda. And then we have uh, runtime uh, live data, that that's mainly user sessions. When you log on to our service, we store some data in our database that we delete as soon as your session ends. And that's basi basically it. So we are not built for internet scale, but we are built for uh, covering the health sector, a couple of hundred thousand uh, people. And uh, one thing that's special about this is that uh, health personnel, they work 24-7. They work uh, during the night. People get sick all the time. 
And so we need to be available. We can't say that in the evening we can have downtime or something like that. We must always be available. But luckily, our traffic patterns are quite predictable. So our service is a very slim monolith. And uh, this is where we get grumpy old guys don't want to build microservices because that's too much complexity. <laughs> so, but for a service like ours, this works. It works very fine. And by keeping everything in one service, we get rid of so much complexity and so much risk. And this may is probably not right for your web-based something-something uh, system. But for uh, something like Helsida, I believe it's the right choice, at least for now. So our technical design, it, uh, it's mainly about handling the risk both for our own complexity, and this design allows us to have uh, as few external dependencies as well, as few as possible. So let's talk about uh, our development process. Yeah, yeah. So uh, the uh, risk model has uh, effects on our, the way we do coding. Uh, what's also affect the way we do coding is that when we release some new uh, feature in test, we can probably say uh, it won't be used in maybe half a year, a year. It, uh, it uh, the um, external vendors have to implement the features we release and they have to deploy it to their customers and it have to be taken in use in the health sector. Mm. That's a long, long lead time. So we do not do that much in new stuff, but we use a really long time of quality assuring it. So uh, small steps, we are, um, we are uh, required to be never break functionality. There are thousands of applications using the stuff we have. It's uh, really difficult to know exactly what features they're using or, uh, at the time, what kind of dependencies they have. So we, we can't break existing stuff without giving a lead time of, say, a year or something. Then we have to be very clear about what we are doing. Uh, we do require a high people in the team, development team, do need to know what they're doing. They do need to understand the protocols. They do have to understand the digital identity topic, which is a bit fuzzy, but uh, difficult. And they do have to understand the health sector, how it works. So it's a lot of, you, have you do have to have a lot of skills uh, for just starting to create code in the healthy decor. Um, as Irina said, we have full control for our dependencies in our code, of course. Uh, we almost never include new libraries. It's, uh, we are also very exact about which Microsoft libraries we use. Uh, of course, we do testing, testing, testing. Uh, unit tests, integration tests, uh, automated uh, UI tests, etc. But again, uh, the ways of using Helsida are many. And there's a lot of combinations of using Helsida, a lot to, uh, which can go wrong, which is really difficult to uh, test automa in an automated way. So Rune will talk a bit mm. about that. I see that we are 20 minutes left. Minutes left, yeah. So you forgot to finish your slide, but that's okay. Sorry. Sorry. <laughs> so, our test environment is basically a production environment. Uh, in other cities, we do have many test environments. We have our internal environment, we have our development environment, but we have the test environment that everybody uses. Uh, in a test environment, we have almost as much traffic as we do in produ production. And that's, uh, that's quite interesting. We have uh, like 500,000, maybe a million tokens per week. So there's a lot of traffic, lots of logons, lots of systems using it. Um, when we publish new functionality to the 
public stable test environment. We expect that functionality to stay there for a long time before we migrate it to production. And, uh, and this is a really good thing for us because uh, as Doug said, we cannot really predict all the ways, all the combinations uh, that uh, the health sector is using uh, our service, all the combinations of the uh, use of our functionality. So while we do lots of testing in our test environment ourselves, we also rely on the vendors. So the, for instance, the National Electronic Prescription Service, they do a lot of testing in our test environment and they give us feedback immediately when we break things. Mm. And that's a good thing. We do uh, suggest that vendors uh, create automated tests against mm. our test environment. Yeah. And run that all mm. the time. Mm. Absolutely. And having this uh, test environment uh, help, uh, helps uh, securing bo both the infrastructure and, uh, yeah, it's it, it helps quality, uh, assure the quality of our service in a way that we could not do on our own if we tested everything uh, ourselves. Right. Yeah. Um, so, uh, as we have talked about, uh, Norsk Helsenet uh, is kind of old school in that way that they have their own operations divisions. It's not the cloud we are talking about. Um, which is, is, is a division and people which is it's very mature. They have been doing this for a long time. They know what they are doing. Uh, really high level of competency. Um, so we trust them. But they are not part of the team, the development team. It's not DevOps uh, as is but we work really closely together with them. Uh, in effect, they are a part of the team. We do have a couple, three persons who we work really closely with all the time. Uh, we talk about functionality, we talk about the processes, deploying the solution into production. Uh, operations understand our solution really well, really well. So, um, and this, uh, this uh, has been really valuable for us. Uh, I don't know if you said that, but till now, we Helsinki Data Service hasn't had any downtime until now. Uh, we have had some downtime because of other problems external to us, but uh, not el nothing else. Uh, the operations teams do, uh, do monitoring. We have something called HelseSat, which uh, 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 monitors traffic in the Norwegian Health Network. Uh, the firewall uh, team in uh, Norsk HelseNet are really good. A big IT system used there. Uh, we have built redundancy upon redundancy. We have uh, uh, we are not on Kubernetes, so we are running classic web apps, but we are uh, running a lot of nodes on both the internet and HealthNet. We have redundancy when it comes to the database. We have redundancy when it comes to the uh, data warehouses. We're running in Trondheim and Oslo. Uh, I'm looking, we will talk more about that later a bit. Um, mm. And we are scaled way too high. <laughs> uh, we, we, uh, we have too much CPU. We have too much memory, uh, and that's on purpose. It's it's uh, not expensive compared to the solution and the service and the value we deliver. Okay, we're all one. That's a good one. So uh, back to risk model. Uh, this uh, is the parts about external attackers and infrastructure, of course. Mm. So our service is, is built to be as available as possible and as resilient as possible. Uh, so as we said, we do not like dependencies at all. I want to talk about uh, uh, not uh, dependencies on the software level, but at uh, 
uh, at the service level. We, we do have dependencies on external registries, for instance. And we do have a dependency on a database. And as I said, we don't trust them. <laughs> Sound a grumpy old guy. <laughs> <laughs> Just that's nobody. <laughs> uh, first of all, we do a lot of caching in memory at, at the host. So we our service is built so that while we depend on a database to have both the live data and the static configuration data, if the database for some reason goes down, that could be a, a, a network outage, it could be a service outage at the database, who knows, then we will, uh, then we know what to expect and we will fall back to a bit lower service level where we will run on cache data. We, we don't stop, we never stop. And that, uh, that can have some consequences for our users. For instance, you might lose the single sign-on offering that we do, that you will have to log on again. But, but everything still works. That's an uh, inconvenience, but it won't uh, cause any major problems for your users. Further on, we have dependencies, as I told you about, for uh, the national registries, both for people and for health personnel. For instance, if uh, the registry of people go down, we still offer information about the user, but you won't get a name. That's, uh, we have control of that. We know how to handle the situation. And the same, if we can't verify that you are a health personnel, then we still offer the information. Not everybody who would use our service needs to be health personnel. You can be administrative personnel and so on. So some, some systems don't require that information. Some do. So if we don't have the information, we fall down to a lower level instead of stopping. The, and uh, we basically consider everything an external dependency. The, uh, this helps us uh, with handling risks uh, when it comes to infra infrastructure, and uh, we consider it uh, valuable when it comes to the use of our service as well. Uh, then we have policies. We do run a very strict security profile in the city. We have some very strict requirements for the systems who use our service and how, how they should implement Telsida. Uh, but sometimes, sometimes we see that availability is more important than information security. So I'd like to now talk about uh, what we do first. Uh, we have one policy, it's quite simple. Telsida as an open ID connect endpoint, we offer a me metadata. It tells about how we work. It tells the signing keys we use to sign the tokens and so on and so on. Uh, this data, we require that everybody cache this information for at least for 24 hours. That way, if our service go down, uh, existing uh, access rights uh, are still valid and can be used. An API can still validate that uh, the, uh, the system is allowed to call me, even though we have seen this down. So this is a requirement on, on our side. Another requirement, uh, other effect, is that we offer a single sign-on. Uh, and we store a cookie in the web browser. So when a user has logged on to Helsida using an external identity provider, no matter who they are, uh, we store information about that user session on our side. That means that the next time a user wants to log on to another system, they get a single sign-on, which is nice. But it also gives us the benefit that should uh, bank ID be down, should uh, bypass or configurers have trouble, we already have cached that information, we know who you are, and, and we aren't dependent on the availability of the external providers. Uh, in addition, every logon provider, identity provider, they offer some information to us. And one of the uh, elements is the security level. How much do we trust that information? And uh, the security level 
gives the same access if you log on using a bank ID or a smart card. It doesn't matter. You get the same access because they are on the same security level. That means that uh, in a hospital, for instance, they often use the smart cards. If the smart card bypass service is down, they can log on using their own uh, bank ID. And they get the same services. They can do the same thing, thing even though their main logon service is down. So that's cool. Um, and then we have other policies. Uh, we have some guys building the national, the new emergency system in Norway. And uh, this is critical, extremely critical. You don't want that them to be down. And uh, normally we have a policy that an access right in Helsida, it lives for between one and 10 minutes before you have to renew it. The reason is security. We don't, if someone steals that right, uh, then they can be you uh, logged on to your system. There's no way of uh, controlling that at the moment. But for a critical system, we allow a much longer lifetime, for instance, an hour for that access right. And that increases the risk uh, that someone steals that access right. But they have done other, implemented other measures that take that risk down, so we can live with it. So we do this, uh, while we have our policies, we do stretch them to ensure availability, because availability wins. Access right is the same as an access token. Yeah. You just left that out, so yeah. you didn't have to go into yeah. that. Is it's as, it's as a note, don't mention tokens, <laughs> because that's a rabbit hole. So these policies allow us to adjust uh, how a service uh, is used. And that, uh, on one side, it uh, pr prevents uh, or helps stop external attackers. On the other side, uh, it helps uh, promote the correct use of our service. So, okay. say a few things about the, the uh, future. We're uh, almost on time, so. Uh, okay, I will do this quickly, so yeah. I have some minutes yeah, for yeah. questions. Um, yeah. Uh, you should wear sunglasses. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> At least if, if you're up here. <laughs> um, yeah. Uh, we are uh, looking into. That's me. Ah, that's the blood Sorry. sugar. Yeah. Yeah, that's my blood sugar. Yeah. That's one thing. If you do a talk, your blood sugar is going going to the skies. That always happens. Mm. Oh. Okay. R uh, w um, I was talking a bit about uh, geo-redundancy. Geo mm. uh, NHN has that sensor in Trondheim and Oslo. We are, uh, have nodes in both places, uh, SQL servers in both places. We are looking at also uh, hosting a standby node of Helsida in some public <coughs> cloud solution, which we can switch over to in case something happens to the NHN infrastructure need to do the DNS stuff, of course, still, but uh, we're looking into that. We always uh, look at our life cycle process. How are we doing stuff from development until production? How do we work? How does it, uh, are, should we do something about it? We, we right now, we might ha have some down time if we do some breaking database changes. We're looking into finding solutions for that being able to have it two different versions of a uh, system in production, having A-B testing, having control over that without using Kubernetes. Uh, and we are looking always, uh, of course, looking at the protocols. Uh, they evolve all the time, new security holes are found. But some of the new mechanisms we are looking into will also provide uh, mechanisms for better availability. Mm. So, uh, looking and looking and looking all yeah. the time. So we don't have time to go into that, unfortunately. That's okay. So, that was the last slide. Yeah. But let's summarize. Can you read the small letters? <laughs> <laughs> but it, but, but it let's says summarize. That we love you. Yeah, we, love, it, we you. love you all. We love you. But I want to summarize. M to, to make sure that our service is available, first of all, we move slowly, extremely slowly, small steps. But all the time, small steps. We may make sure that we uh, offer functionality that is uh, useful. We look at what we do. We try to know what we do and try to be good at what we do. 
And then we, uh, we are standing on the shoulders of giants. We have the identity server guys. We have the teams in Norskelsnet that are incredibly good at what they do. And I hope you, the rest of you also have a good operations team, good monitoring <coughs> team, security teams, and all that, because that's really important. Mm -hmm. So, thank yeah. you. Thank Everybody. you, everybody. Thank you. And uh, we're staying here for the rest of the conference. Please come talk to us if you want. And if someone has questions, we have, uh, yeah, we three have a couple minutes. minutes. Yeah, yeah. No questions. That's a good sign. No, ah. that's one. How the how an external attacker will get reach us our service when you have a closed network? That's a good question. The we are our service is available both <laughs> on the internet and in the health network. And even the health network, while it's it's a closed network, it's a very large network where all hospitals, all health personnel in Norway are connected. And most of those uh, them also have a uh, connection to the internet. So there are ways in to our service. Luckily, we have uh, people monitoring uh, all the traffic, working on the firewalls, working on routing all that. So we have lots of people who are experts on uh, reducing the risk. And we see they are, for instance, filtering a lot of traffic all the time that would otherwise hit us. But we are available on the internet, and that's probably the greatest risk for our service. Good question. Uh, a question uh, back there? Uh, huh. No. So the question is that an attacker not only might want to get into our service, but might, might want to just take the service down to hurt other services. Mm. Do you want to reply? Or? Yes, uh, yeah. we do. Uh, in, in that, uh, there's something with my voice. <laughs> um, we do rely on Norsk Helsnet to do the DDoS thing, that part of the uh, solution. Otherwise, uh, as I said, we our attack uh, um, attack vectors uh, is kind of like two or three endpoints, which we have proof really, really good control over. Uh, we do get some protection from how those endpoints are handled by identity server implementation, and we have our own stuff built on top. So we, we do have full control over uh, <coughs> parameters who are sent us and how we treat them. Mm -hmm. So uh, for volume uh, and NHN, Take that bit while trying to mani manipulate us by doing something with the, the information they send us. That uh, we take care of that. I can also say that since we have redundancy on top of redundancy on top of redundancy, yeah. so should someone take down a service, we can shut it down and nobody will notice anything. Should they manage to take down an entire data center, that's no problem. We automatically switch to another data center. Should things go completely to hell, then we have a completely automated uh, deployment processes, so we, we can uh, up and running somewhere else in uh, a very short time. We haven't tested that, but uh, <laughs> uh, we're completely <laughs> automated, so we can <laughs> get up and running quickly. Uh, uh, sorry, Fredrik, uh, back there first. Sorry. Yeah. Oh, uh, oh, how long are things available in testing before going to production? That's a good question too. Um, mm. Months. Yeah, months. Yeah, at least. If there is, um, we, we are, the thing, uh, when we deploy something into production, very often vendors start using that functionality. So, at so, uh, so uh, sometimes the, the milestones of the vendors affect the, how much time we use before going into production. 
Uh, that was the case with health platformen, for example, in the midnight year right now. Mm. So mm. it depends, kind of. We do not have a kind of strict uh, for yeah. the, the toys a year mm -hmm. or something mm -hmm. like that. Yeah, so, and then also, right now, then, uh, so when things uh, go into production, usually it can be a year, maybe m several years before the functionality used even then. So mm. <laughs> we are in the health sector. We are moving slowly. I believe there was a question here first. Yeah. Uh, the, you mentioned the impact of the impact. Yes. And that your test environments are very uh, production-like. Mm. Yes. Uh, are you using any rapid testing in the test environments, uh, aka with the PS monkey from uh, Netflix? Uh, uh, no one, yes. Not automated. But we do run our own test where we switch off a server, see what happens. Actually, we're <laughs> next week, we're going to do uh, that in uh, one of our private environments, our QA environment. We're, gonna, we're just going to shut down and just to verify that uh, we don't have an interruption in our service while we switch over to another data center. If that goes well, we're going to run the same test in our test environment, and maybe in production. I don't <laughs> know if we did there. <laughs> but, uh, yeah. but we don't do like the automated with the chaos monkey and all that. I don't think the energy and Norskelsnet operations team would be too happy about that. <laughs> <laughs> Do we have time for one more question? Yes. Yeah. There is. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah that's an important point. <laughs> yeah, that uh, your yeah. service, they are running, uh, <laughs> then uh, they're building the emergency services that are replacing the existing system, and they will run just fine even if, w if we go down. But it won't be fun, will it? You have to, have to redeploy, and your users won't be happy. Yeah. They won't get the national emergency information. So it, you can still help people, but uh, the quality will be reduced. Anything else? Nah. All right. Good. Thank you very much for being here. It was